The reading today is from Proverbs 11, 16 through 18. A kind-hearted woman gains honor, but ruthless men gain only wealth. Those who are kind benefit themselves, but the cruel bring ruin on themselves. A wicked person earns deceptive wages, but the one who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. It's interesting. <laughs> Let's read about a mom in the Bible. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's like you have to bear with the slides a little bit. The fonts didn't carry over. I really don't put one under one. So just bear. Sometimes the computer up there, it doesn't always, we've just seen computer stuff all day today. So just be okay. If you see something goofy, it's not the way it was intended. Just go with the words, not the formatting. First Samuel chapter 1. Uh, we'll just start reading at the beginning. First Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, another was called Penaniah. Penaniah had children, but Hannah had none. It sounds like this is going to be a story about a man, which would be very appropriate for this time. It's what would be expected. There wouldn't really be anything else. Instead, it's going to be a story about a woman. Verse 3. Year after year, this man went up from the town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Lord Almighty. It's, uh, in Hebrew, we'd see it as the Yahweh of hosts, or the Lord of hosts, or think God of angel armies. This is the title given to God. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penaniah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? But once when they had finished in eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I'll give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Now, Eli the priest, he thinks that Hannah's drunk and Hannah explained that she's not drunk, but distressed and that doesn't even get, there's just this anguish of spirit. Verse 17. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Hannah soon has a baby, and she names him Samuel. Samuel. Verse 21. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy's weaned, I'll take him and present him before the Lord, and, and he'll live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay there until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord." 
For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Chapter 2 records Hannah's prayer. It tells the story of Eli's sons. It's a sad story. It's not very long, but as a parent, it, it breaks your heart and what you see. But then we hear again of Samuel in verse 18. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Now, the ephod's like, a, it's an apron-like garment. It would be worn under the, under the other priestly clothes. You might remember David, King David, dancing before the Lord, and it's all he was wearing was the linen ephod. And his, his wife, Michael, looked on, and she was disgusted that he wasn't a little more distinguished in what he wore. There was that ephod. But even for a boy wearing this ephod, it indicated he was already ministering before the Lord. But the ephod's not all he would have to wear. Each year his mother made him, verse 19, each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. And then they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah, and she gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Uh, we can almost hear Hannah say, from me to you, a mother gave herself, a mother gave her son, and, and she even gave little robes. You can just kind of envision in your head what that may have looked like. And the result of all of this, people learned about God. People learned about God. This God of angel armies, this Yahweh of hosts, that's used through often, so often throughout the books of First and Second Samuel. Listen to some of the things that Samuel said during this, this, he had this lifelong ministry before God. Just listen to some of the things he said. There's so many to pull from, I've just pulled a few. As he's continually talking about and teaching about and reminding people about God. When Israel turned from wrong living, and then when they turned back to God, Samuel said, Dave, can you do me a favor up there? Can you jump out? My regular slides are on the desktop. Can you just play that, play the PowerPoint from those slides? It'll just help a little bit. I'm just, I know as a, when I'm out there and watching and then I see, I think, whoa, something's, I just want to have a connection be there. Otherwise, we'll just go black screen. If you just want to hop out of that, and I think the slides just exist on their own on the desktop, if you will. And we'll come back to this. We'll give Dave just a minute. And I appreciate all of those that are up there. As Dan and I were just talking about that this morning, it's back there is where you're so often on the hot seat. And as I don't want it to be that way, but I definitely want to, what you're seeing and what you're hearing, I want everything to, to coincide a little bit, if you will. Because we've got some other things that will come into play here shortly. Is that up there, Dave? An awkward pause, isn't it? Oh, now that, those, that font looks familiar. All right, for Samuel 1, we read that. And if we can go one more, Samuel, and one more, please. Ah, thank you. That's it. So Israel turns from wrong living and turns back to God. Samuel, as a prophet, as a priest, he says, If you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths, these poles that represent a goddess, and, and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve Him only. And He'll deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and their Ashtoreths and serve the Lord only. Uh, Samuel were reminding them of God. In his farewell speech, his ministry farewell speech, his farewell almost of life, he says... Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. The, the, the little boy that was wearing his mom's little robes, and now he's being used by God to say things like this and to teach a people about this God of angel armies. He adds in that same speech, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things He has done for you. 
What a reminder, a call back to the people to remember what's most important. Giving to them so they can know more about God. His job wasn't always easy. He was also the one to tell King Saul, your reign is done. Also be coming in and, and taking your place. Speaking at that time, he said to Saul, He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. For he's not a human being that he should change his mind. It's not always the good things that he had to say. Sometimes it was reminding of who God is. But teaching them, giving them the word of God so they would know. So Samuel, this is his ministry. It's his life. Samuel ministers to other people. And as a result, people learned about God. We could just stop there and just those four things that he said that's enough right there to keep us busy this week, being mindful of, of who God is and what God has said. It's not just little words to dabble with. It's powerful words that he speaks. So a mother gives herself, gives her son, and, and even gives little robes. The result? People learn more about God. But as I read that story, and I think that seems so long ago, and let's not kid ourselves, it almost sounds a little too cute, the little robe thing going on. Maybe it doesn't even seem quite realistic. But I'd like you to watch a video of something closer to our time, something closer to our location than what the events of these were. So Dave, if you will play that, play that video, we'll watch this if you will and then we'll come back. I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? My neighbor? We are television neighbors, aren't we? You and I. I wanted to show you some of these sweaters that I wear really close up. But first, I want to show you this picture of the person who made them. This is a picture of my mother. She knits the sweaters that I wear when we have our television visits. I just wanted you to see her picture and to look very carefully at the beautiful work that she does with her knitting. There's one, another. See each stitch she makes with her hand. Takes a lot of practice and a lot of work. She makes sweaters for many different people. But that's one of the ways that she has of saying that she loves somebody. She uses needles and yarn and her own hands to knit the sweaters. You know, when I put on one of these sweaters, it helps me to think about my mother. I guess that's the best thing about things. They remind you of people. Mm -hmm. It's such a good feeling. I kind of want to sing with that. Some of you were singing there at the beginning. I heard that. Thanks, Dave, for doing that. He said she would give us each a hand-knit sweater every Christmas until she died. Those zipper sweaters that I wore in the neighborhood were all made by my mother. Apparently after she died, he said that they were able to find some that were close. They looked very similar, so later on they weren't that way, but those early episodes, uh, all made by his mother. So you can almost hear Mrs. Rogers say, from me to you, and she would hand these out, what it sounds like was on Christmas, little did she know. The mother gave part of herself, even made sweaters. And the result? People learn more about God. 
Yeah, learn about God. You knew Mr. Rogers was a minister, didn't you? Yeah, he was a minister. A 1963 graduate of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and an ordained Presbyterian minister. Listen to some of the things that he said during his life. Speaking about his choice to be vegetarian, he said, I want to be a vehicle for God to spread his message of love and peace. And you can see that as you think about different episodes, can't you? Uh, it was a commencement address in 2001, uh, Marquette University. He said, I believe that appreciation is a holy thing. That when we look for what's best in a person we happen to be with at the moment, we're doing what God does all the time. So in loving and appreciating our neighbor, we're participating in something sacred. In a letter to a friend, he penned, I'm fairly convinced that the kingdom of God is for the brokenhearted. You write of powerlessness, join the club. We're not in control, God is. From his 1994 book, he said, It's a mistake to think that we have to be lovely to be loved by human beings or by God. Hannah and Mrs. Rogers, <laughs> mothers who gave. And the result, people learned about God. We've talked about moms today, and it's appropriate, but the stories, they could have had different people in them, and they could have ended the exact same way. In fact, the stories did end the same way. The story of Naaman, a military commander for not Israel's army, but for Israel's enemy's army. And Naaman had leprosy, but his wife had a young slave girl. And the girl gave what she knew. She knew about this prophet named Elisha. And she knew that if Naaman could just talk to Elisha, his life would be different. And we found out because of what she did, you can give what you know. The man was paralyzed. But there were some men, I've often said friends, we just don't know. There were some men that knew what he needed. Unable to get him through the crowd, they took him through the roof. And they got him in front of Jesus. And we found out that sometimes you can give your time, you can give your energy, you can just give your strength for a moment. There was another lady. She used clothes like Hannah and Mrs. Rogers did. Her name was Tabitha or Dorcas. We don't know if she was a mother or not. We just have no idea. But she gave what she made. We found out you can give what you make, whether it's clothes or food or blankets or cards or crafts, anything, you can give it. And what happened in each of these? Hmm. We'll make note that Naaman found out in his own words, there is no God in all the world except in Israel. That's from the commander for the other army. <laughs> there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And it started because a little slave girl gave what she knew. The paralyzed man learned firsthand about the healing of Jesus. Uh, healing not just of the body, which he received, but even more importantly, he heard the word, your sins are forgiven. He found out there's a healing of the soul that can happen. Because there were some men that were willing to give their backs for a little bit, their time for a moment. Tabitha, her death led to life. Not just hers, but as Luke tells it, this became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. And it started because of some things that she was making and she gave. What are you giving so people can learn more about God? What are you giving so people can learn more about God? These aren't the only stories of people giving so people can learn about God. The, the Bible is filled with these stories, but nowhere else is it better seen than when the scene itself was this tiny little Judean town called Bethlehem. And there it is. The God of angel armies gives himself. He gives himself. People learn about God. He made something for you. 
He made something for you in that moment, something for you to wear, something given to you so that people can learn more about God. Let me explain. The Apostle Paul, he teaches in his, what he writes. He says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. How is that for something to wear? Wearing the Son of God. Wearing the God of angel armies. It's as clothing. Not distant. It's beyond personal. And it's not just for when you're little. And it's not just for when you're with the neighborhood friends. It's something that's from God and you never take it off. With Christ on, with Christ on, what are you giving so other people can know more about God? Yet, you'll say, I, I don't really know if I can give anything, or I, I don't know what I would do, or I've been baptized, but, but how do I live what you say I'm wearing? Paul helps us again. Paul says, and do this. Understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night's nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul's readers, his Jewish readers especially, would have understood the image of clothing. Putting on somebody else's clothing and to speak of it that way would have given you that person's power. Think again of a, the, the lifetime of Elisha. Elijah goes to heaven in a whirlwind, a story on its own. What's left behind is his cloak, his coat. And Elisha has that. With Elisha having that in his hand, he uses it to divide the Jordan. Those who were watching said the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And now with Christ having returned to heaven, you can wear what he's given you, what he's left behind, and what he's handed off to us. And that's, that's what you and I can give to those around us. Paul describes what that life looks like. We just had a snippet of there as he describes it. It sounds like in our lives, we also do some dividing. We divide light from darkness. We divide right from wrong. He says that's what the life looks like. And other people then know about God. Moms, you've given us more than many of us will ever know. There's those behind the scenes things that we just don't even know. We get a better grip of it when we get older. Maybe we're parents ourselves, but moms, you've done a lot. And keep showing us what good living looks like. We're your child or not. We're watching. We're learning. And as dads and elders and teachers, employees, we want to give so that somebody else can know about God. And as friends, as neighbors, as customers, as deacons, as ministry leaders, as teachers, as commuters, whatever it is, we can also be giving so others know more about God. So what will you give? What will you give? And how will what you give help somebody else know more about God? First, are you wearing what God has given you? God is giving you Jesus. He's shown us what the God of angel armies looks like, and he shows us this is what that looks like lived here. And then he says, you wear it's God's gift. And if you are, what are you giving? Of what can you say to somebody else, this is from me to you? Why? So somebody else can know what you know. It may be something you made. A little robe, a little sweater, 
or something else that you make, whatever it is that you make that you're good at. I would think of Tabitha, her work was known about. What is it that you're known for making? And how can you use that? How can you and God use that so somebody else knows more about him? Maybe it's something you know. Like where someone can get the help that they need. It was the little slave girl. She just knew that Elisha, Elisha's the one you've got to go see. What is it that you know? Maybe about anything. It doesn't have to be about a prophet. It may just be where somebody can go, some information somebody needs. But the end result is God uses it so they know about him. Maybe it's something you have. It's your time, your energy, your strength. Something you actually have in your home that you can lay your hands on. Something that exists but that we don't ever really grasp, like love and forgiveness. Can you give those to somebody else so that they know more about God? In doing any of these, you're wearing what God, is, God has clothed you with. Jesus. I wish we could see what that looks like, but maybe we can the way Paul describes it. When you think about those people, when you think about what Jesus, what a Christian looks like, and that person comes to your mind, that's what it looks like. Will you be that person that gives in that way? God's way. The God of angel armies. And as he gave Jesus, he says, from me, you. Will you put Jesus on if you haven't? It's like clothes. Paul writes about this baptism, and you, you look like Jesus. You go down into the water and you come back out. <laughs> You're wearing Jesus. And we call it forgiveness, we call it grace. Will you put on Jesus if you haven't? And if you have, if you're wearing Jesus, what will you give today and tomorrow and the next day or whenever you're in the neighborhood or whenever you're at the Lord's house? What will you give so that somebody else can know about God? Let's pray together as we finish. God, thank you for giving Jesus to us. Thank you for letting us wear what we can't always see. But yet, with faith, it's very vivid what it is. Will you please help us to look around us and know what it is that we have that we can share? Thank you for Hannah and how she gave. Thank you for Mrs. Rogers and what she gave. Thank you for those that have given to us and continue to give to us. And thank you for the ways that we've been able to give to other people. God, God of angel armies, we want the world to know about you. We want them to know a little bit more about who you are and what you're doing. We long for somebody else to know what we know, to have what we have, and and really to wear what we wear. May you work through us as individuals, as a church family, to do that. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus, the one who showed us what God looks like. Amen. Amen. Will you put Jesus on if you haven't? If you have, will you make sure today that you give so that somebody else knows about God? We'll stand and sing together. Today is a unique day, and it's far bigger than we think, because there are many different kinds of mothers, and all are being honored today. For the mother who's chosen to stay at home while her children are little, may your patience be great and your influence even greater. For the single mom who never planned on doing this alone, may you be consistently strengthened by your Heavenly Father and may you hear His voice singing over you. 
For the mother who strives to balance work outside the home with love inside the home, may you be given energy, validation, and hope as you make the leap from one world to another every day. For moms who had poor mothers themselves, but who now refuse to let that pattern repeat itself, may the godly legacy you've started be carried on for generations to come. For mothers with grown adult children, may today be filled with laughter and joy, and may you experience deep satisfaction and fulfillment. For women who have no biological children of their own, but who mother younger women as mentors, may you understand your role as a calling from God and as a transformation of their hearts. Today is a unique day, so for all the mothers we mentioned, and even those we didn't, be blessed, be honored, be filled with joy. You are making the world a better place because you're filling it with a love that only a mom can give. May I have all of the children who are not in children's worship up to high school age please come up. I only get two times a year where I can embarrass all of you, so come on. they cute? As you can see, I have in my hands my children's wonderful projects that they've made today. This is what every mother gets every Sunday. So thank you, teachers, for caring for our... I'm not going to make it through. Thank you, teachers, for being moms to our lovely kids. Thank you, aunts for being moms to our kids. Thank you, friends, for being moms to our kids. We have a wonderful set of kids. And I will have to tell you just today an example of how wonderful our kids watch out for each other. We had one running down the stairs, and all of them ran down the stairs to get her. <laughs> They're excited. So, kids, on the count of one to three, what would you like to say to your mothers? Okay, ready? And then we're going to pass out flowers to all our moms. So after the kids yell at their moms, I'm going to have my mommies, and well, basically all of you are going to stand up. So, <laughs> ready? One, two, three. And I would like to first, great grandmothers. Do we ha I don't think we have a great great, but do we have a great grandmother right over there? Please applause that woman. She has been through a lot. I won't make you stand, <laughs> but I will make all of our grandmothers who are allowed to stand, please stand. And all of our mothers, please stand. And anybody who is an aunt and uncle or who has ever touched one of these children's lives, please stand. Anybody who is standing, they need a rose because women are roses. Delicate flowers, but we can be thorny. All right, go ahead, everybody who's standing, please get one. Even if they're sitting, please get one. 